Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Schumann. I'm a partner at Goodwin Proctor, and I'm one of the founders and co-leaders of our cannabis practice group at Goodwin. I have with me today my partner and co-leader of our cannabis practice at Goodwin, uh, Jen Fisher. We're pleased to present at the Growth From Home conference. The topic we'll be presenting on is entitled Litigation Avoidance for Investors and Cannabis Companies, Minimizing Risk. So Jen and I both litigate uh, and, and we're also uh, regulatory lawyers. We're going to talk about some cases, but the overarching theme here is to try to prevent litigation. And so each time we talk about an area of litigation impacting the cannabis industry, we are also going to try to talk about some helpful tips to potentially minimize or avoid litigation, understanding that it's impossible to completely avoid litigation. So with that, here you have a little bit more about myself and Jen Fisher. Uh, as I said, I'm uh, in the San Francisco office of Goodwin Proctor. I'm the office chair, and I also co-founded and co-lead our cannabis practice group. Jen, want to you introduce yourself? Thanks, Brett. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to the Growth Conference for, for having us. We're excited to be part of this virtual event. Um, as Brett mentioned, I'm one of the co-chairs of Goodman's Cannabis Practice. And um, my practice focuses on regulatory compliance and litigation um, representation of cannabis companies at all uh, levels of the supply chain um, from, you know, suppliers. Um, wait, can I... Stop just, say, just, say, just say redo and it'll uh, redo. Come right okay. Um, thanks, Brett, so much for that introduction. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Jen Fisher, and I'm also one of the co-chairs of Goodwin's Cannabis Practice, and I'm also in the San Francisco office. Thank you to Growth for having us today. We're really excited to be part of this virtual conference. Um, my background is representing companies in litigation and government investigations, and also providing regulatory co compliance advice and counseling to companies and investors in the cannabis space. So we're excited to talk about um, some risk mit mitigation strategies with you today. And uh, this is just another slide on our cannabis practice at Goodwin. Uh, really cuts across uh, many areas of Goodwin's practice. We do litigation, obviously. We do uh, M&A. We do a lot of regulatory uh, compliance counseling. IP uh, really uh, runs the gamut. Here are the topics we're going to discuss today. First, we're going to talk about cannabis contract disputes. Uh, and uh, federal court or state court with a question mark, we're going to talk about some of the issues cropping up in cannabis industry related litigation in federal court and whether it makes sense to try to stay in state court. We're going to talk about failed M&A transactions and broken deal litigation. We're going to talk a little bit about cannabis trademark litigation. We're going to talk about the TCPA and TCPA litigation, which is uh, rampant in the cannabis industry these days. And we're also going to talk a little bit about consumer class actions in cannabis. As I mentioned, for each of these areas, we're going to try to provide some uh, tips, best practices to minimize the risk of these types of litigation um, as we go through. So we're going to start with cannabis contract disputes. Question, federal court or state court? So we have some quotes from some of the key cases here. Let me start by saying that there was, uh, there's always been a, a bit of a concern, I think, among members of the industry regarding being in federal court when the subject matter of your dispute involves cannabis, because after all, cannabis remains uh, a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substances Act. So the question has always been, you know, how are the federal courts going to react to this? How is a federal judge going to react to being presented a dispute where the underlying subject matter uh, involves essentially a federal crime? Uh, in 2016, and it's a case that I, I have on the next slide. In 2016, there was a case out of the Northern District of California that provided some comfort where uh, the court there certainly addressed the issue, but nevertheless found that enforcing the contract that issue in that case did not 
implicate the Controlled Substances Act and, and therefore it could be enforced. And I think a lot of people collectively breathe a sigh of relief. However, um, there's been a number of much more recent decisions that have caused quite a bit of concern about being in federal court on cannabis related disputes. We have those cases collected here on this slide. So the Bar Street case um, is, a, is a recent decision from earlier this year out of Nevada, obviously a adult legal, uh, recreational legal jurisdiction as well as medical. Um, and here a federal judge was presented with a dispute. Uh, essentially the plaintiff had loaned, uh, plaintiff Bart Street had loaned some money to the defendant, ACC Enterprises. The money was to be used to um, fund operating costs, pay down loans, all associated with a cannabis cultivation facility in Nevada. Uh, and bad things happened and the plaintiff wound up suing the defendant for $4.7 million. The court, uh, short version, it's a lengthy and somewhat complicated opinion. The, the court, the judge in Nevada in that case, found that, that many of the provisions of the contract could not be enforced in federal court uh, because the underlying subject matter involved cannabis. Also granted summary judgment for the defendant on an unjust enrichment claim and found that a federal court could not award unjust enrichment because that would be essentially transferring cannabis related money. And here's the quote from the case, uh, providing funds in exchange for equity uh, violates the CSA because it would allow the investor to profit from the cultivation, possession and sale of marijuana. Conspiracy to cultivate marijuana is a crime of moral turpitude. That is language in 2020 coming from a judge sitting in one of the states where cannabis is legal for both adult recreational and, and medical purposes. It's a little bit shocking, actually. Um, uh, there's another case from 2019 here out of Seattle, uh, the Western District of Washington, Polk versus Guntmacher, uh, involving a dispute between two business partners. Uh, they had a handshake deal uh, to engage in a, um, a manufacturing and retail cannabis business and the deal fell apart and the plaintiff sued seeking uh, essentially lost profits damages uh, profits for the share of the partnership that that he Polk was cut out cut out of and again here a federal judge in a jurisdiction that's very cannabis friendly refused to uh, uh, enforce that agreement or award those damages based on the Controlled Substances Act and here's the key quote from that case. Mr. Polk's claim that his requested relief would not require a violation of the CSA defies logic. He is demanding the future profits of a business that produces and processes marijuana in violation of federal law. Uh, the last case that I will mention here um, is another recent case from 2020 out of Oregon. Again, another cannabis friendly jurisdiction. The, the very surprising thing about this case actually is that neither party raised the issue of whether the contract violated the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, this was another uh, loan situation and uh, the plaintiff sued uh, for breach of the agreement. It was for some uh, greenhouse uh, equipment used that was going to be used for a cannabis grow facility the plaintiff sued for 5.4 million dollars uh, and the court refused to enforce the contract the court the, the defendant only raised a uh, limitation of liability clause in defense the court on its own uh, so-called sua sponte for the lawyers out there raised the question of whether the court could enforce the contract and the court found that it could not. And here's the key quote, awarding plaintiff damages for lost profits for the sale of cannabis would require the court to compel defendants to violate the CSA. The plaintiffs were requesting lost profits damages due to their inability to operate the greenhouse because the defendant failed to, uh, to live up to its obligations under the contract uh, to build the greenhouse. So these are three fairly recent cases 
that really uh, raise the question of whether it's safe to be in federal court if you have a dispute involving uh, the underlying subject matter is cannabis. Now, this is the 2016 case that I referred to earlier, Mann versus Gullickson. This case involved a loan, and the defendant, um, Gullickson, simply defaulted on a note, and the plaintiff, Mann, sued to enforce the note. And in this case, a judge in California, uh, before, adult rec before adult recreational uh, became effective, but nevertheless, a judge here in California found that, that she could enforce the contract. In other words, she could require the defendant to, to make note payments without violating the Controlled Substances Act. And here's the key quote from the case. Even where contracts concern illegal objects, where it is possible for a court to enforce a contract in a way that does not require illegal con conduct, the court is not barred from according such relief. So it's a little hard to square all of these cases um, at, at some level, the man case involved a note and a loan, and the court said, well, uh, by ordering a note payment or damages for breach of a note, uh, I'm not ordering a violation of the Controlled Substances Act or endorsing a violation of the Controlled Substances Act. On the other hand, where you're seeking lost profits or something approximating a share of the revenue from the cannabis business, in the prior cases, the, the judges and the court seem to be saying, uh, you can't do that in federal court. Um, that would violate the Controlled Substances Act. Um, these are all district court level decisions. Um, we don't have a definitive word on this yet from the Supreme Court or even from the intermediate level courts of appeals. Yeah, Brett, one thing I would just mention, um, you touched on this earlier, but some of these seminal cases come from states like Oregon and Washington and Nevada, where there are well-established state legal cannabis programs. Um, and so one tip for, you know, for those of you out there that are engaged in cannabis, the cannabis business and are entering into these contracts, and we'll get to, you know, some of the tips you can think of, but it doesn't, you know, even if you're going into federal court in a state where there's a well-developed cannabis industry, it does not mean that you will be able to seek the kind of relief you want because federal judges are, are going to be looking at the CSA and whether enforcing the contract implicates the CSA and deciding whether or not they can award the relief they're seeking or even hear the case. Thanks, Jen. Couldn't agree more. So on this slide, we have um, some specific state statutes. Um, that are relevant to this issue. There's a huge, uh, what lawyers call choice of law issue embedded in all these cases. And, and what the federal judges have generally done is said, I have to apply federal law. Even if the contract, for example, in the Nevada case specified Nevada law, Nevada state law, the federal court, the federal judge says, I have to look at federal law here. Um, there are a number of states uh, that have that have specific provisions exempting cannabis related contracts from uh, the lawful object doctrine, sometimes referred to as in peri delecto. In Massachusetts, for example, there's a statute that says contracts entered into by cannabis licensees or their agents or by landlords of cannabis licensees shall not be unenforceable or void exclusively because the actions or conduct permitted pursuant to the license is prohibited by federal law. California has a very similar provision. Uh, Jen and I are both in California. We know this provision well. It's Civil Code 1550.5, and Nevada has a similar provision as well. So this really begs the question, or raises the question, uh, should you uh, take your chances in federal court? Maybe you get a man versus Gullickson type result. Um, or should you try to remain in state court? And certainly one of our tips, and Jen and I have published articles on this subject as well, is you probably should try to keep your dispute in state court for now. Uh, those 2020, 2019 cases are scary. Um, you never know which side of the dispute you're going to be on when you're entering into the contract. You have a greater chance of getting justice from a court uh, willing to consider the dispute if you specify state court. So we call that a forum selection clause. Um, 
forum selection clauses are enforceable. Forum selection clauses, um, usually in this circumstance, you would want to accompany it with an express waiver of removal jurisdiction to federal court to prevent one or the other party from removing to federal court. But uh, our tip, our, one of our tips here is to specify uh, forum, forum resolution. Let's edit that, please. Um, one of our tips here is to specify a forum selection clause of state court and not federal court. Um, another tip would be a choice of law provision. Uh, this one is secondary and probably not as potent as the forum selection clause, uh, because as we saw, even where uh, the choice of law is, is a state law that's friendly to cannabis, a federal judge uh, might still invalidate the contract. But nevertheless, choice of law. Pick a state law that has one of these cannabis contract friendly provisions like we had on the prior slide. That would be helpful as long as there's a logical connection between one or the other party or the business operations, you can pick a state that's friendly to cannabis as your choice of law. And our last tip here is to consider arbitration. This is a bigger topic. There's lots of pros and cons uh, for arbit to, to arbitrate as opposed to resolve a dispute in court beyond the scope of this discussion but certainly you're unlikely to encounter the type of resistance that we saw in those federal cases if you're before an arbitrator uh, that the parties have agreed can resolve their dispute. Um, anything to add there, Jen, before we move on to the next topic? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is that if you're out there and you're a cannabis entrepreneur, almost every contract that comes across your desk that for vendors, suppliers, other licensees, um, if you're not in a vertically integrated state, they're going to have some of these provisions and you will be in a position where you can, um, you know, request that, you know, the form selection clause, the choice of law provision, that those reflect some of these priorities and tips. And that is a great way to mitigate the risk of you not being able to enforce your rights under the contract if a dispute arises and the same with arbitration. So read your contracts carefully. We've seen a lot of contracts come to us that were not well drafted and didn't have these protections in place. Um, so we recommend paying attention to those clauses when you see what may look like a form contract coming to you from a vendor or supplier or business partner. Great, thanks Jen. Okay, I think uh, this is your turn. Jen's going to cover failed M&A transactions and broken deal litigation. Yeah, so um, as many of you probably know, we're seeing an increase in um, in failed transactions. So broken M&A deals. Um, we've also seen some investors walking away from potential investment opportunities. Um, and so we're going to talk. Spend a little bit um, of time talking about. Um, why that's happening, how people get out of deals after they may have entered into an, an initial contract, um, and some ways you can avoid um, having an acquiring company or a company that you're looking to buy um, have the deal fall through. So one, one important clause that is oftentimes um, included in um, acquisition agreements is referred to as a MAC or an MAE clause. And, they refer to similar circumstances where um, there's, there has been a material adverse change or a material adverse effect. Um, on, so where the circumstances that the parties understood when they entered into the original agreement have changed in a very material and adverse way. Both of those words are really important. It has to be material and it has to be adverse. So it has to mean that there, because of circumstances outside of the party's control, um, there the circumstances have changed in a way that the deal does not look the way it should or, or was contemplated by the parties when they entered into the original agreement. So these clauses allow an acquirer um, to walk away, for example, if the value of the company declines dramatically. Um, and we've seen a lot of, of of speculation around whether, for example, COVID-19 would be considered a material adverse change or effect. Um, and so, you know, thankfully for our industry, a lot of companies in the cannabis space have been able to sustain operations and generate revenue in even despite the 
shutdown orders because, because many of those businesses were deemed essential. Um, and so the operations were able to continue, although there were lots of ancillary impacts of the coronavirus on the supply chain. Um, and so this is something that, that parties are looking to. Um, and one of the limitations on this clause and the ability to just walk away from a deal is that it, you know, these clauses, the material adverse change and effect clauses really are only available if the circumstances are unique to your company and not to your peers in the industry. So that's kind of eliminated the ability of people to walk away specifically for COVID-19 reasons because everyone's been impacted in, um, by the coronavirus and, and um, some of the economic uncertainties that, that it's brought with it. Um, another issue that we see oftentimes um, after a transaction has been initiated and a party wants to weigh, walk away is because it's been, it's been discovered that there was either factual misrepresentations made or concealment, so um, omissions is what we call it in the law. Um, and that's, that's what happens when, you know, usually acquiring companies and investors do a lot of good due diligence, but as this is still an emerging industry um, and there isn't always as, you know, as much due diligence going on as there may be in other industries, and there's lots of reasons for that, um, but some things aren't discovered until after, and that's because the the company that's being considered for purchase makes material misrepresentations or conceals facts either about its financial situation, its operations, um, the validity and of its licenses. Um, any any whole whole host of issues can arise, um, and this can lead to not only a broken deal, but allegations of fraud, which can be very problematic for the company who made the misrepresentations or omitted um, important and material information and hid it from the potential investors or the um, buyer. Another thing we're seeing, particularly in the cannabis space, is that there are often underlying regulatory problems um, that either haven't come to fruition yet or are there and have been there for quite some time, but the companies haven't been forthcoming about um, the impacts of those regulatory problems, or the, cl the clients, the companies in the space just haven't developed robust compliance programs um, to meet the expectation of potential buyers and investors. Mm -hmm. And so underlying regulatory programs, problems can present some real issues in this space, particularly because it is such a highly regulated space. And the key value proposition for any cannabis company is their license and their um, legal ability to operate in that state and other states where they may have licenses. So underlying regulatory problems can present themselves in lots of different ways. And I think, you know, whether it be um, past audits by regulatory agencies or local inspections that didn't go well, um, or, you know, issues with disclosures that were made in connections with the licensees that were not adequate or up to what was required by the regulations. So those are some um, underlying regulatory problems that can lead to a, a, a broken transaction. Another factor is, you know, the lack of having, you know, good audited financials. I'm sure everyone in this space can appreciate that for a long time, it was not possible um, to have a really robust set of audited financials. A lot of the companies are also very new in the space and may not have a long track record um, in, a particular, um, in a particular jurisdiction. And some companies just, you know, because of the cash related nature of so many of these businesses and the inability to, um, to get financial services, that leads to a lot of books and records with companies. And so um, this can create issues both in terms of expected revenue generation and profitability and how that's evaluated by a potential acquirer or investor and tax issues. Tax issues is a big one. Um, we see a lot of times, um, you know, the more an acquirer, acquirer learns about a company's um, potential tax liability, the less attractive it becomes in terms of it, you know, it being a potential target for an acquisition or an investment. So now that we've laid out kind of all the things that can go wrong in these in, in these deals, um, we 
thought it would make sense to talk about how to avoid them um, and how to make sure that if you're looking to buy a company or to sell your company or to, you know, um, bring in new investors, how you're doing everything, how you can do everything you can to avoid some of these risks. Um, and I think, you know, really, really robust due diligence is probably the key. Um, having a very well-developed diligence checklist of all the documents that you would like your the prospective company to provide to you so you can review. And if you're on the selling end, to be prepared to have your records in order so they can be made easily available to the acquiring company or to an investor. And so adequate due diligence is really important and not just the, the exchange of documents and information, which is very key, but also site visits, um, extensive discussions with management and in the executive leadership to find out you know what really makes this company unique and how is it operate how does it operate in the space who are its business partners who are its consumers what is its consumer base what are the you know um, brand opportunities how do they, how do they differentiate themselves in the market and really get a robust understanding of, of the company that you're looking to invest in or acquire and if you're on the other end again just being really prepared for those kind of those kinds of conversations and being ready to answer lots of hard questions in in quite a bit of detail um, that you know we we always recommend of our clients who are sitting on the investor side or you know, companies that are looking to acquire another company in the cannabis space um, to do a really, really thorough due diligence, um, particularly on the financial and regulatory side, in addition to, of course, operations. Um, and um, so, you know, some of those items that we tend to request in the diligence checklist includes, you know, the full history of all communications with regulators. You can see you know, the status of their interactions with the local and state regulators who um, oversee the jurisdictions that they, where they have licenses, um, all of their financial records to the extent they have them ready, and, and then, you know, hiring your own advisor to help you go through those, to evaluate them, all of these things um, are the steps you can take at the initial stages when you're courting one of these deals to make sure it all goes smoothly um, and doesn't um, end up as a broken deal. Thanks, Jen. Um, why don't we move on to uh, trademark litigation? I was about to ask for any questions, but of course, uh, since we're all doing this virtual now, there can't be any questions. Sorry, folks. Um, Cannabis trademark litigation. I'm going to cover this uh, this module of our presentation. I do a lot of IP litigation and including trademark litigation in the cannabis space. Some of the cases that we're going to talk about here are actually cases that Jen and I are working on, and therefore we will keep it pretty high level when we're talking about pending cases. Um, the key issues in cannabis trademark litigation are likelihood of confusion. And that's a key issue really in any trademark case, um, but it becomes particularly interesting in uh, the, the cannabis space. Who is the senior user of the mark? And we have some emerging uh, decisions on that, on that part, uh, on that point. And then um, we're gonna talk a little bit about litigation against unlicensed, what we call copycat cannabis companies. Um, excuse me, sometimes uh, we just refer to these folks as bad actors. So there's a lot of words on this uh, slide, and um, there's a number of recent decisions, again, coming out of the federal courts. Uh, trademark litigation does not have to be in federal court, but in many cases it is, and so we've gotten a number of recent um, cases coming out of the federal courts here. Um, oftentimes in trademark litigation, the plaintiff, uh, the one alleging a likelihood of confusion, uh, brings a motion for a TRO or a preliminary injunction. And many of these decisions are at that stage. It's a very important stage of litigation because if you think about it, the plaintiff is asking early in the case for an injunction uh, to require the defendant to stop using a trade name. So it can be hugely consequential. Um, the first case uh, that we talk about here is Lochero Fruit versus Tarokino Holdings, coming out of Washington State, Seattle again, and it's a decision from last year. The plaintiff here, Lachiro, had a, a had trademark rights in the happy in the name Happy Apple, and 
uh, remember, we're up in Washington and uh, Happy Apple, the churro, they sold sort of candy apples and apple cider and other apple products under the Happy Apple brand. Interestingly, they did not have a federal registration for that, that mark or that name, but that doesn't matter. You can still bring a trademark infringement case. Tarokino Holdings started selling cannabis, a cannabis infused apple beverage under the Happy Apple brand. Uh, and so not surprisingly, uh, Lachiro filed a lawsuit um, and brought a motion for a preliminary injunction. And the court denied the motion for a preliminary injunction. And the reason it did so is interesting and really rooted in some of the unique features of the cannabis industry. Um, and, and we have a quote from the court's reasoning here uh, in, in our slide. Um, well, and I'll read it. While both products are sold in the state of Washington, defendants' products contain cannabis, and cannabis-containing beverages can only be distributed and sold by retail stores licensed and regulated by the Washington SLCB, which is the regulatory body. These retail stores may only sell marijuana, so defendants' products and plaintiffs' products are not likely to be sold in close proximity to each other. In other words, the marketing channels are different. It's unlikely, impossible really, that you're ever gonna walk into a store and see the plaintiff's happy apple cider sitting next to the defendant's happy apple cannabis infused beverage. And so for that reason, the court in the Lochero case found no likelihood of confusion and denied the plaintiff's motion for a preliminary injunction. The next case is one of those cases I mentioned that Jen and I are handling Kiva Health versus Kiva Brands. Um, and in this case, the plaintiff, Kiva Health, is a Hawaii company that uh, did apply for and does hold uh, federal registration for the Kiva name in certain classifications, including uh, uh, chocolates, um, candies, and others. And our client is the defendant, Kiva Brands, a, a well known uh, a brand, a cannabis confection company. They make cannabis-infused chocolate, cannabis-infused gummies, and, and other uh, cannabis confections. Uh, Plaintiff brought a lawsuit alleging trademark infringement, likelihood of confusion, and brought a motion for preliminary injunction. Uh, later in 2019, so after the Lochiro decision, judge in California denied Kiva Health's motion for a preliminary injunction. And we have a quote from the case uh, from the order, and again, the, the, the rationale is similar to the Lochiro case, and here's the quote. At a high enough level of abstraction, the goods are related. They are both food items sold to people looking for food, but upon any closer examination, they are quite different. One is candy combined with a recreational drug. The other is health food. KHB, the plaintiff's products, are available on the internet while KBI's products, the defendant, our client's products, are only available to adults over 21 years old and or approved medical marijuana users, and then only through state licensed dispensaries and delivery services. So again, you see these federal courts starting to make a distinction here based on the fact that the cannabis infused products can only be sold in special stores, these state licensed dispensaries. Therefore, there's not a likelihood of confusion. The next case is a little bit more complicated. And then the last case I'll get to here real quickly is a, is, is a case where the plaintiff did secure a preliminary injunction. Uh, the next case though is Woodstock Ventures versus Woodstock Roots. As I said, this is a bit of a complicated case, but uh, Woodstock Ventures is the um, owner of the IP rights to the famous Woodstock brand starting back in 1969 with the Woodstock Festival in New York. And the defendant, Woodstock Roots, uh, has also been around for a long time and uh, operates radio stations and other businesses. Both of them hold federal trademark registrations for the name Woodstock in different classifications. So. Uh, the, the defendant, Woodstock Roots, has a trademark registration that includes the category smokers articles, okay? 
and uh, the plan of Woodstock has a registration for certain categories as well. So Woodstock, the plaintiff, wanted to start going into Woodstock branded marijuana. And it brought a lawsuit seeking a declaration that that would not infringe the defendant Woodstock's trademark rights. The defendant Woodstock responded with a motion for a preliminary injunction. So the defendant here filed the motion for preliminary injunction to stop Woodstock from going into the recreational marijuana product market. The case, there was a preliminary injunction hearing and a judge in New York denied the defendant's motion for a preliminary injunction. This one pretty clearly was a closer call though than either the Lochiro or the Kiva cases discussed above. Here's a quote from the decision. Even if the party's products are marketed through the same or similar channels, this fact does not suggest a likelihood of confusion because plaintiff's products either constitute or are intended for use with recreational marijuana, while defendant's smokers' articles are not intended for use with recreational marijuana. That's obviously um, slicing the salami a little thinly there. Um, the plaintiff Woodstock wanted to sell not only Woodstock branded marijuana, but Woodstock branded vaping devices. And uh, Judge Gardefee in New York found that that would not uh, create a likelihood of confusion with the defendant's registration for smokers' articles. Um, interesting tidbit about this case, you, you can't get a federal trademark registration uh, for cannabis products uh, or cannabis marks uh, under current uh, rules of the trademark office. And so in order to get their registration for smokers articles, the defendant Woodstock had to expressly disclaim using the smoke, smokers articles with marijuana. And that, that sort of figured in the judge's decision. Um, uh, I still think that's a pretty close case, but nevertheless, the preliminary injunction motion was denied. And then, as I said, the last case here uh, is a case where the plaintiff actually got the preliminary injunction motion. This case arises out of Arkansas. Whitehall Pharmacy is a, uh, um, a well-known pharmacy in, uh, with, I believe, two locations in Arkansas. The defendant, Doctor's Orders, got one of the licenses to operate a medical marijuana dispensary. It was in close enough proximity and the plaintiff Whitehall Pharmacy started getting inquiries from confused customers inquiring you know, when they could come pick up their medical marijuana. They brought a lawsuit, sought a preliminary injunction, supported that by a number of uh, declarations and they got the preliminary injunction. And again, here you don't have the issue that you had in the Lachiro case or the Kiva case where the products are being sold in fundamentally different uh, trade channels. Here you have a pharmacy, the plaintiff, and a medical marijuana dispensary, the defendant, um, and the plaintiff produced a lot of evidence of actual confusion. Here's a quote from the case. Whitehall Pharmacy argues that since medical medicinal marijuana is directed at medical ailments, medicinal marijuana and pharmaceutical services are related. The court concludes that the party's services and products do overlap to some extent. The court therefore finds that this factor weighs in favor of Whitehall Pharmacy. That's one of the many factors the court looked at. And as I said, the court ultimately granted the preliminary injunction motion. Um, Jen, anything to add there before I uh, finish up these slides on trademark? No, I think that was a great overview. Thanks. Uh, fascinating area of the law. Um, so uh, one of the other topics we wanted to talk about is what is the significance of the senior user in trademark law? Senior user is, is eponymous. It's, it's what it uh, sounds like. Who's the first to use the mark? Generally in trademark law, the senior user has superior rights to use the mark over junior users, the people who come later, including the right to register the mark with the USPTO. Related to the senior user, uh, is prior use. Uh, prior use can be a defense to trademark infringement claims, and prior use can also be a basis for canceling a federally registered mark. So the senior user can come along and challenge and, and cancel or have canceled uh, a registration achieved by a junior user of the mark. 
Um, that may not be the case with respect to cannabis though. And again, here we talk about one of our cases, so we're gonna keep this pretty high level, but in the Kiva Health versus Kiva Brands case, the defendant, our client Kiva Brands, indisputably, factually, is the senior user. Kiva Brands debuted in December 2010, almost 10 years ago now, selling cannabis-infused chocolate bars under the Kiva mark. But because cannabis is illegal, Kiva was unable to register for uh, federal trademark protection with the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. Two and a half years later, the plaintiff, Kiva Health, began selling natural foods and health supplements under the Kiva mark. And in April 2014, they obtained federal registration for the Kiva mark. So the defending Kiva brands is pretty clearly the senior user factually. In this case pending in California federal court, though, our client Kiva brands asserted that it was the prior user, the senior user, of the mark in commerce as a defense. Um, judge Breyer, however, the federal judge holding, uh, handling the case, uh, disagreed on the ground that cannabis is illegal under federal law. Here's a quote from Judge Breyer, quote, while KBI's product is legal under California law, which is true, its illegality under federal law means that KBI cannot have trademark priority. This is a district court level decision. The case is not final. It hasn't been appealed. Uh, and there's no uh, higher court that has held uh, that this is the law yet. But it's, it's one of those interesting developments associated with the fact that cannabis remains illegal under federal law and something that uh, trademark litigators and trademark lawyers need to watch out for. Lastly, we come to copycat, copycats. And I mentioned earlier, I would just call these folks bad actors, okay? Um, uh, and, and we can just focus in the interest of time on the picture on the right. Um, this was a pretty notorious case. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Stony Patch, you're talking about a very popular children's candy uh, and, and candy that maybe a few adults uh, presenting here today enjoy as well. And somebody came along and pretty clearly knocked it off and created a cannabis infused um, uh, gummy. Um, and the plaintiff was Mondelay in this case. They sued and had really no problem at all shutting down Stony Patch. Uh, same thing with the case on the left, a very popular uh, hot sauce, and somebody comes along and knocks it off. Um, there are bad actors um, in all industries, and um, not knowing um, anything about the defendants in these cases, I would suggest that these were not very close calls. Um, these are uh, copycats, uh, knockoffs, and it's dangerous. So, um, as we said, a couple of avoidance tips. Avoidance tips here. Um, one, don't be Stony Patch. <laughs> Okay, uh, Sour Patch Kids, a uh, very popular brand, uh, lots of brand recognition. Um, and uh, so don't be Stony Patch, uh, and I think we can leave it at that. Um, however, though, for most of the other cases I was just describing, um, how do you avoid a trademark litigation like our client Kiva Brands is caught up in and some of the other cases that I mentioned? Well, one thing that you certainly can and should do is a trademark clearance search before adopting a brand name. Um, and uh, these come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, you can do them, uh, non-lawyers can do them. You can search the internet, spend a bunch of time on the internet looking for names and make sure that someone else isn't using the name. Uh, that's helpful, it's better than nothing. Um, a proper search done by a lawyer, it can be done efficiently um, and cheaply. Every firm probably has different pricing. Um, this is not a sales pitch for our firm, but it is, quite inexpensive to do what we call a knockout search. That would be searching the USPTO's website for other registered uh, names to make sure that the name that you want to register for your business is not already registered by someone else. Again, that's a very quick, cheap search to do. A slightly more involved search, a more comprehensive search, still relatively inexpensive. You could probably ask uh, each of the uh, defendants in these cases, um, and, and I will say that in the case of our client Kiva, such a search was done. 
um, of course, our client there was the senior user. So a proper search would not have turned up the junior user Kiva Helm. But um, a proper uh, comprehensive search is a pretty good investment. Um, if you hope to build the next leading brand in cannabis, you want to make sure that that name is not taken. Jen, anything to add on trademark before we move on to TCPA? No, I think we're good. Great. Uh, Jen, take it away. TCPA litigation in the cannabis industry. Uh, you all might have heard a lot about the TCPA, which is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And many of you might be wondering what it is. It's basically um, a statute that prevents robocalls, which we may all think is a good thing to have on the books. Um, but for cannabis companies, it has for sure caused a lot of headaches in the space. Um, High level, the TCPA restricts outbound calls and text messages. Um, it's one of the most litigated statutes in federal court. The damage recovery can be huge. So it is a favorite of the plaintiff's bar because for each unauthorized call or text, the damages can be $500 each. If it was willful or intentional, that amount gets trebled. So we're talking $1,500 for each unauthorized text message you may want to send to your potential customers. Um, when these cases get into litigation, getting out of them can be very expensive. Um, this class settlement numbers in this, in this um, space are huge. Um, oftentimes, the plaintiff's lawyer will find one um, class representative who receives a text and then seek discovery to find out every other person who might have received the same text. And then voila, they have a class action and they're suing you. Um, and it, they can be tricky, they can be hard to get out of, and they can be super expensive because there's not many defenses. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of these TCPA litigation um, cases brought against all sorts of industry participants in cannabis. We list a, a lot of them here, but basically almost anyone at any level of the supply chain and investors and um, executives and um, ancillary service providers can, can get caught up in these um, types of cases. Um, the allegations typically center around the fact that consumers were sent text messages and they never consented to receiving them. Um, but companies can also be liable um, if they facilitate, authorize, or direct these calls or texts. So even if you're using third parties to help you roll out your marketing plan, you will still, you as a company, if, if they're marketing texts are for your brands or your products, you can be held responsible for those texts. Um, the Supreme Court is actually going to take up a TCPA case. Um, there's a lot of detail on this slide that I won't go into, um, but there is a circuit split, meaning the courts of appeal and the, the federal courts of, of, of Federal courts of appeal have taken two different positions on what constitutes an automatic telephone dialing system or an ATDS. That's you know defined in the statute, and um, the law prohibits companies from using an ATDS to contact consumers without their consent. So the main question is, what qualifies as that? Um, does it have to be um, a machine that basically allows for robocalling? Or can it, is it, does it also include any device that is stores um, and can dial numbers automatically? Um, for a lot of players in the space, they're hoping that um, the Supreme Court does not agree with the Ninth Cir Circuit because under that line of reasoning, almost any sp smartphone would be considered an ATDS and it would really expand the scope of what really was traditionally an anti-robocalling statute. And as the last bullet here. Go ahead, Jen. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, because, because this case is currently pending before the Supreme Court, we've seen that a lot of litigants um, that are, are being faced with these lawsuits are seeking stays, so the lower courts don't make any rulings or decisions while this court is pending, uh, while the case is pending. And all I was going to add is that we are defending some of these cases for some of our cannabis industry clients, and we have filed some of those same stay motions that Jen just referred to. 
So the best way to avoid a TCPA suit is to do everything you can to minimize the risk that you'll be hit with one. So we um, just identified here some avoidance um, tips. The key one really is consent. Get the consent of your um, customers, consumers in your space before you reach out to them with a call or a text. Um, and consent can happen in lots of different ways. You can put in an opt-in, you can ask for their consent, um, but either way, you should have a very robust policy um, in place that identifies in connection with any kind of informational, non-marketing or marketing campaign that you might be engaged in, that there is an ability for a customer to opt in um, and provide the consent that's, that's necessary in order to avoid TCPA liability. Um, it's also a good idea. We recommend to our clients that they have a do not call policy available um, and a process by which if someone decides to opt out or, you know, as many of you probably know, if you just enter stop when you get a text message that you don't want to get anymore, that the company has a way to track those messages and make sure that those consumers do not get any further texts. Um, there's some time time limitations in place that um, you know really give rise to a lot of irritation, which sometimes leads to these cases. So we always recommend no marketing calls or texts before 8 a.m. or 9 p.m. to either residential landlines, which many people don't use anymore, or cell phones. Um, and then always identify yourself, um, who you know the company's name, the caller's name. If you're sending it, you know, have an individual sending it, um, always identify yourself at the outset of the call or the text. And um, hopefully, with these tips, you can avoid costly um, and very cumbersome TCPA-related litigation. Yeah, as I said at the inter introduction, these cases are really uh, running rampant right now in the cannabis industry. We are defending some of them, and we are also uh, writing these. Uh, policies that uh, Jen uh, alluded to for a number of clients and hopefully uh, those policies will uh, uh, you know, avoid these kinds of costly litigation. So let's move on to our last topic, uh, consumer class actions in cannabis. Um, and uh, look, cannabis is a consumer product and so therefore it's not surprising to see uh, plaintiffs, consumer class action lawyers uh, coming into the industry, bringing cases, uh, same lawyers that we've seen litigating talcum powder and asbestos and other products before, uh, other products you get in the supermarket. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of cases around whether the amount of tuna fish in the, in the tuna can is actually what it says on the label or not. And we're starting to see cases like that crop up in the cannabis industry. Um, these are some of the typical claims or causes of action here in California, uh, unfair competition, false advertising, Consumer Legal Remedies Act. Uh, many other states have similar uh, statutory provisions, of course, preventing false advertising, unfair competition, um, and then common law claims, unjust enrichment. Um, so these are the typical claims we're seeing in these cases. A uh, couple of cases, again, that our firm is handling, so we won't talk too much about them. Uh, Jen, do you want to say something about the Raw Garden case involving the question of what live resin is? Yeah, so this is a great, um, really interesting case and very unique to the cannabis industry. But the, the plaintiff has alleged that um, Raw Garden, which offers a live resin product, um, that it, the marketing and um, promotion of that product was deceptive because it's not actually um, a live resin product. And really what this case will turn on is what's the definition of live resin. And what's interesting is because this is cannabis and so much is new and evolving, there is really no industry-wide solidified definition of what, constitute li what constitutes live resin. Um, and so it's, it's, it's going to be fun to litigate. It's really an interesting case. Um, lots of issues of, of first impression. Um, but, you know, I think um, this is one of those uh, cases where the consumer, you know, what a consumer understands to be the product it's buying um, is really at the core of the allegations brought by plaintiffs. Yeah, and um, it might be interesting, um, but we certainly we filed a motion to dismiss the case, a demur in California state court parlance, and we don't think the case even gets past first base. Uh, but certainly, if the plaintiff's able to get past our demur, 
it does raise some of these interesting questions. Um, uh, the Kiva case here uh, at the bottom is really illustrative of a whole category of these cases. Again, this was one of our cases. This case is over. We won. It's been dismissed. But the issue in this case was how much THC is actually in those edibles. So, of course, um, cannabis-infused chocolate, gummies, products, state right on the label how much THC is in the, the product. Um, and that's usually supported by testing at a third-party testing lab. Um, there's a number of cases out there, including this case against Kiva, where a enterprising plaintiff's attorney has taken the product to a different testing lab, run it through some tests, and concluded that the amount of THC is not precisely what is on the label. Um, there are some regulations now, in California at least, where um, there can be some variance, some tolerance. Um, it's minimal. Um, but um, there's a whole group of these cases, um, and we will talk momentarily when we get to our sort of avoidance tip slide about some things that you can do to avoid them. Uh, but as I said, this case uh, was dismissed recently, um, and, and the allegation was, I think it was one of Kiva 60 milligram uh, chocolate bars. Plaintiff took it to a shady testing lab, shall we say, and that lab uh, returned a test that showed only about 46 or 47 uh, milligrams of, of THC. So um, that was the predicate for the case. Um, another category of these cases that we're seeing involves the, the, the uncertain status of CBD under current FDA uh, policy. So the De Silva versus Infinite Product Company case, here the defendant sells uh, hemp CBD infused gummies, topicals, etc. And the plaintiff filed the complaint after the FDA issued a warning letter to the defendant, um, which talked about how the defendant's products were um, unapproved and how adding CBD made them adulterated. Uh, the plaintiff allegation in this case and also in the Charlotte's Web case below uh, may strain credulity a little bit, but the allegation is, hey, I didn't know when I made the purchase that this was an illegal product under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. I wouldn't have made the purchase if I had known that you didn't disclose that. Therefore, I get my money back and I'm here as a representative of a class. Um, again, these are two examples of a number of these cases around the country brought by what I would call enterprising plaintiff's lawyers. So we have a few avoidance tips. And um, you know, the first, the first bullet point is pretty important here. As the cannabis industry grows and achieves more and more success, whether on the CBD side, the THC side, or other cannabinoids, um, it's, it's a little hard to completely escape the plaintiff's lawyers um, because they are just looking for the next uh, sort of area of law where they can bring cases. Um, but a couple of things that you can do, uh, and, and I should just add to be really clear, I don't mean that disparagingly. Um, that's just the way plaintiff's lawyers operate to the point of whether you could ever truly avoid them. I don't think you can. Um, but a couple of tips. First, avoid making unsubstantiated health claims. That's what's going to get the FDA's attention. And as we saw in the De Silva case, if you get the FDA's attention, a class action um, could likely follow. Um, so uh, there's a lot of research going on right now. There's a lot of things that a lot of people in the industry believe are some of the health benefits of either CBD or THC um, or the entourage effect. Um, you should really minimize the unsubstantiated health claims. Um, another uh, helpful tip is to ensure proper packaging and labeling. There's all sorts of requirements um, at the state level and ultimately we're gonna have those requirements, uh, I'm, I'm sure from FDA um, for CBD and for THC when THC is no longer criminal. Make sure your product packaging is compliant. Um, that could be uh, in California, uh, uh, cancer labeling, cancer warnings. Um, there's a lot of uh, detail in the packaging, make sure it's accurate. And finally, use a reputable testing lab and retain the certificates of analysis. I mentioned the Kiva case, that we won. There's a bunch of other cases out there. It's a regulatory requirement that a third party testing lab tests at least batch samples of your product. Um, but keep those certificates of analysis, deal with reputable testing labs. And if you can't avoid the litigation, that, that type of practice is going to lead to um, really solid evidence that enables the defense lawyer to make the case go away sooner rather than later. 
Jen, anything to add on that before we wrap? No, I think those are great tips. And um, always, if, if anyone has any further questions about those, I know as Brett mentioned, this isn't a live interactive Q&A, but you, you know where to find us and um, we'd be happy to answer any questions or provide more mitigation strategies if you're looking for that kind of advice. So thank you for spending a little bit of time with us today and thank you to the Growth From Home folks for inviting us to do this presentation. We certainly enjoyed it. Thanks everyone.